morning, everyone. Pam, thank you so much for um, that analysis and uh, introduction. But let me first thank everybody for being here for the sixth annual Data Privacy Conference in the United States and for the National Press Club hosting it and for all of the participants being here. And Cam, thank you for your leadership and constant thought about uh, Center for Technology and Innovation and the things that the United States of America needs to focus on. Uh, the forum, obviously, is a great opportunity to talk about privacy and where we are. And as Cam just mentioned, last April, my colleague Kathy McMorris Rogers and I released the American Privacy Right Act, a comprehensive privacy law that would set a bright line on the national standard for collection use security that is stronger than any state law that is out there on the books and would put the United States in a global leadership position on privacy. And just to, Kim, we first introduced this legislation when I took over as ranking member of the Commerce Committee in 2019. Uh, Senator Wicker and I worked together for many, many uh, months on that legislation and then introduced two separate bills as a way to motivate both of our uh, caucuses to take the issue more seriously and get the discussion going on a policy front. And then as negotiations fell apart on four corners, the House bill proceeded uh, on a path that we knew would run into consternation, particularly with Nancy Pelosi being the speaker and knew that would have very little chance, but we're thrilled that it took the basis of our bill and made it the basis of the discussion. So since 2019, we've been growing this muscle and concept, and we're very excited that today that we are at this point, at least, in the conversation. A lot of knowledgeable people around the United States and certainly on the Hill about what the choices are. There are three reasons I believe that we will continue to see this issue grow in importance, there thus needing action at some point in time. But it's worth really focusing on those this morning for a couple of reasons. First, the United States needs to assert global leadership on privacy. Kim mentioned this, and thank you for that historic rendition of why our country is so uh, strong here. Me personally, you know, with the number of privacy rights uh, that exist uh, ignored by the courts in their recent Dobbs decision, but uh, William O. Douglas, being a justice from the state of Washington, very proud of privacy in the United States of America and the implications of that in many, many different subject areas. But as many of you know, 70% of the countries around the world have enacted a national privacy law, the United States wanting to be the tech innovator and home as we are to the largest tech companies and data centers, you also need to be the leader, not just on innovation, but on rooting out bad actors. This is a pretty fundamental understanding of policy at a state legislative level or at the federal level. You have to count on the industry willing to police bad actors because if you don't, your industry can't move forward. And there's a lot to move forward on in the information age, a lot more excitement still to come. We need a bright line. The European approach, the GDPR, uh, the internet with cookies and banners has created a more structured, reliant on bureaucracy approach than bright lines. And I think the United States of America could do better. We know that relying on cookies and notices and consent aren't enough to protect consumers. Consumers don't have the time or the resources to do due diligence on every single company that they transact with. And according to a recent study, a consumer will need to spend 47 hours a month to read through privacy policies for the most commonly used websites. So it's no wonder consumers just hit accept so they can go about their online activity so we need to shift to a framework from burdening consumers to setting that bright line for companies about the proper collection and use of consumer data. A US privacy law is, in my mind, a business necessity. 
Our digital economy is global. It's a global economy. And because we are not setting the standard, the United States that is, there is uncertainty for the US leadership position in innovation, and it creates a disadvantage when operating abroad. In the absence of a law, there have been several efforts to establish cross-border data transfer frameworks that meet the GDPR's adequacy requirements, but successful legal challenges in Europe invalidated prior frameworks, creating confusion for American companies about how and when they can participate in this cross-data flow. U.S. technology leadership strengthens our economy. For example, our leadership at the Wi-Fi technology last year's radio conference helped U.S. companies that are leading to develop Wi-Fi and develop economic growth for years. And that is why I personally believe in a technology NATO. That is, that the most sophisticated democracies and technology countries should come together to set the operating standards for how technology should work. That is, that we have more power against other countries like China or what have you if you say these five democracies, these five technology countries have said these are the standards for privacy for any other issues like AI in the information age. Setting those standards would then allow us to say if you don't meet these standards, you shouldn't buy technology from these countries. So a very good position for us to be in if we can get there. If the rest of the world wants to work with us or sell products, you need to meet these standards. The United States leads the world in innovation and technology, so I believe it's time to lead in privacy too. The second reason the demand for the privacy law is going to continue to grow no matter what happens in a lame duck or happens next year, is that the American people are growing tired of this problem. In a poll after poll, we see overwhelming support for more, not less, privacy protection. In 2024, a survey by US News & World Report said that 84% of respondents said the federal government should implement stricter data privacy laws. This is true across the political spectrum. In 2023, the Pew Research Center found that 68% of Republicans and 78% uh, of others supported more privacy regulation. So this is true in my home state where recent polls showed that nearly 90% of respondents were concerned that companies were violating their privacy by misusing and selling personal data. Only 7% said they were not worried about that. Uh, it makes you wonder who are those 7%. <laughs> uh, so I think it's safe to say that America is being fed up are going to continue to grow in uh, very anxious ways. In a recent USA survey, USA Today poll, 74% of Americans said the government is failing to protect their personal data online. Today, in the absence of a federal law, data brokers have about 3,000 points of on you as a PC, uh, single consumer. That is that that data broker has collected data on 260 million US consumers, more than the entire adult, popul entire adult population, and a single consumer has maybe 2,000 companies uh, with information embedded on the internet. So consumers against those odds feel very helpless and the demand for Congress to deal with this issue is only growing. Consumers, in fact, uh, want some control over their data. Uh, University of Pennsylvania study found 91% of Americans want to control their data. Meanwhile, it's very important, I believe, to define what are serious harms. That is what our bill does. This is about the policing of the industry, of the bad behavior within the industry that allows us to continue to move forward in the information age. A Seattle man's car insurance went up 21% because his car was collecting and sharing information about his driving. Data brokers are selling women, women's location data showing Planned Parenthood visits with little regard to how it could be used. 
addiction treatment information is being given to advertisers. Data brokers are selling health data about our troops for as little as 12 cents. Emergency room patients are being targeted for personal injury, um, uh, personal injury information. The solution to consumers feeling powerless and frustrated is not a patchwork of state laws. Americans should have a strong federal privacy protection no matter where they live or no matter where they travel. The solution is not to pass a weak federal bill with no privacy right action. We need a strong national standard that can weed out the consumer harms that are serious to consumers and defined in our legislation and allow for that enforcement in court. This, I believe, is a much better bright line, less bureaucratic, definitely an improvement upon what we are trying to do for an information age that is continuing to unfold. I mentioned to a couple of colleagues, and I'm glad Julie's gonna be up here on the, on the, uh, the panel and appreciate Microsoft's support of this legislation, but uh, I learned a long time ago in the Enron crisis how critical it was to have a bright line. We had markets that were manipulated and a lot of people thought, well, antitrust was the answer, when in reality, antitrust, people were not colluding on price, people manipulated supply, and thereby we didn't have, well, we turned out we did have a good law on the books against um, what was then manipulative devices or contrivances. And a lot of colleagues thought, well, what, what does that really mean? But the fact that the SEC had had that in their back pocket for years meant there was a lot of case law on it. And thus, it had been defined as a little acorn that was planted and yet turned into a mighty oak, as it was then much, much case law on the interpretation of what does manipulative devices mean. That is where we need to go with harm. Significant harm needs to be defined over a long period of time by many cases and decided how to protect consumers of most, the most egregious attacks. I'm very proud that we were successful in putting that anti-manipulation authority into the CFTC and into the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission where today it has been used to stop manipulation of uh, electricity markets, natural gas markets, and most recently used in a case uh, on oil markets as well. So the notion is you have to police markets against bad actors and abuse. So I think that is what Americans want. So we have two issues, the need for technology leadership on an international basis to set standards by having a privacy law, and we have consumer anxiety reaching a high pitch fever when consumers now know this could be used on price <coughs> issues that are affecting them. Those two issues alone, in my opinion, demonstrate enough why we need to move forward on a federal privacy law, but let's just throw another one in, the kicker for really why we are going to have to get legislation, and that is that AI puts all of this on steroids. AI brings us to an inflection point, whether we can establish the ground rules or really leave consumers defenseless. As many technology leaders know that we needed to do something when AI continued to move forward. Artificial intelligence lets companies use that data about online or offline behavior to infer, to infer, infer, infer all sorts of behavior about people. Most that they have no idea is even happening. No data point is too insignificant. AI lets companies take the massive troves of collected data and derived sensitive insights about people from information that used to be insignificant and too burdensome to process. There is a broad consensus, though, that AI makes privacy even more critical. For example, Ryan Callow, a law professor, co-director of the University of Washington Technology Lab, recently testified before our committee, quote, Privacy rules are long overdue, but the acceleration of AI over the past few years threatens a bad situation to turn to a dire one, end quote. Brandon Pugh of R Street has written extensively, quote, 
there is a need for comprehensive federal privacy and security laws has become more urgent with the emergence of AI technology, end quote. And Victoria Espinel, the CEO of BSA, don't know if she's here today, but the Software Alliance testified that, quote, our nation's privacy laws will impact the development of AI, our use of AI will impact Americans' privacy. The United States needs a strong, comprehensive federal privacy law that creates important limits around how companies collect and use consumers' information, end quote. So AI is going to allow bad actors to even get away with more harms. And the best we could do is to pass a law defining harms. Here are some examples of the AI accelerants and the need. Chatbot interactions can be analyzed to infer personality traits as accurately as self-reported personality tests. Our intimate conversations can be reported by smart devices and flagged and used against consumers. We are starting to see data used to set individual prices like food delivery apps, charging iPhone users more than Android users. I hmm, wonder why. Rideshare companies charging more when your battery is low. Older consumers being charged more for online dating platforms. Our sensitive data is being used to train our artificial intelligence in, in many different ways. And personal data is also kindling and supercharging AI to enable fraud a very big issue that I have seen. Uh, a consumer scam recently used a CEO's voice along with AI deepfake technology to defraud a company of $25 million. I was at SeaTac Airport and ran into a woman who literally was trying to get adult services to help her elderly aunt who had paid $60,000 million, $60, because she truly thought Kevin Costner was flying to SeaTac to visit her. And this was an incident where the woman uh, potentially had used, showed her enthusiasm for Kevin Costner, probably could look up her income level, probably knew that she was worth that level of a scam and got the money and her family was still trying to protect her. Neural data derived from our brain activity can now be possessed by AI decoded into speech effectively revealing important information. And this is just the beginning. It's hard to imagine a not so distant future when our thoughts and personalities and emotions and conversations are systematically collected, decoded, and decide what price we should pay. I know from a, a, a young colleague who was working in China that one of the issues that they were doing there was identifying people's income levels. So when you called the restaurant, if they knew what your income level is, and they didn't think you were gonna buy wine, that table was a different price value to the restaurant. So they just started turning down reservations for people at certain income levels. So all of these things can be used against you and we don't even know that they're happening. The Federal Trade Commission's recent actions to investigate uh, personalized pro pricing is an important data point. There is a demand for rules of the road of AI and consumer data and pricing based on <coughs> vulnerable moments and attributes and so you shouldn't be charged more just because your battery is about to die, but these are unacceptable. We have a unique opportunity for a bipartisan solution to give Americans that greater privacy protection they want and the bright line that businesses who are operating within a accepted norm can continue to grow these important opportunities for our economy. I was very proud to work with my fellow colleague Chair uh, Rogers on the American Privacy Rights Act, because literally I saw the coming together of both the left and the right around this notion that people deserve to have their day in court. Not something I know that the business community always gets comfortable with, but when it comes to substantial harm and bad actors, the community just needs to get together and understand that substantial harm is a very minimal bright line, very minimal and consumers who have significant harm, significant financial, significant personal harm, should not be subject to binding arbitration with people who may have caused that harm. This too is a changing dynamic in Congress. Many bills have already flown off the Senate floor based on the notion that my Republican colleagues now don't believe that people who had substantial uh, sexual uh, uh, harm should be in 
negotiation with the people that may have caused that harm and uh, thereby passing changes to that legislation. That is going to continue to evolve with my colleagues. So we're here this morning to talk about, and the panel I'm sure will address many of these issues, to set a national privacy standard that will provide that certainty and security and give small companies what they need to do to continue to move forward. Many of my colleagues have uh, on the left have said, well, we don't know if Congress is the right federal privacy standard because we have gotten a lot done lately. I get that, complaining, I get and understand that. But a lot of that anxiety is about this basic right to protect consumers. I personally have been involved with four COVID bills, a aviation transportation safety bill in the aftermath of the uh, max crashes, a massive investment in infrastructure, the IRA, the Chips and Science Act, and an FAA bill. All of those just in the last six years. So the notion that Congress can act is not true. Now, I do get that people think that maybe the federal government is losing that power as we rip our country apart with people who show up here only to run in front of the camera as opposed to legislate. But there is enough legislative muscle left in the United States <coughs> Congress. It is not totally forgotten. And on important issues, we can plant this tree. So I'm asking all of you today to help us continue to highlight the need for this federal legislation to make sure that America's leadership on this issue is not over, but just beginning, just like the innovation, our ability to police our harm is there and it's a strong muscle. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>